So tonight, I'm going to be talking about the stock market, the U.S. stock market, and share buybacks. So for the last 18 months, give or take, the major U.S. stock market indexes, especially the Dow, have not done a whole bunch. The S&P 500 is closer to at or near all-time highs rather than the Dow, although the Dow is still a little bit below 27,000. We'll have to wait for the Trump tweets Monday through Friday that are coming out trying to pump the stock market with positive lies about China trade negotiations. As you guys know, and I've talked about this at length, I even did a short video update, there were new charges against Huawei that were filed in the last uh, couple days, last four or five days. Kyle Bass put them out on his Twitter. So either that's going to be an attempt to get more leverage and strong arm the Chinese, or the U.S. really doesn't care about a trade deal with Huawei, with China if they're putting more sanctions on Huawei. So one of the two scenarios. Meanwhile, Trump's going to tweet and say there's positive negotiations. The reality of the situation is there's more charges by the Department of Justice against Huawei. So the stock market, there's a very interesting chart in research out by Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. He's a very well-respected global macro writer. He, uh, a lot of people on Wall Street subscribe to his newsletter. He almost got a job at the Federal Reserve probably better that he didn't probably make more money and not get any of the blame for what's coming. So I wanted to talk about share buybacks. He put out this chart that shows that since 2009, I couldn't fit the whole chart on here. It's a massive chart. It's the full thing is in the Wall Street for Main Street Facebook group. But since 2009, cumulatively, the S&P 500 companies have bought back over $5 trillion worth of stock. Last year alone in 2018, there was over $1.1 trillion in share buybacks, just a massive amount of, amount of them. It's very controversial about share buybacks because there is empirical evidence that over the long term, share buybacks make stock prices go higher. However, with share buybacks, the problems companies get into, and I was going to talk about some case studies with this, is when they use debt for the share buybacks. And that's what a lot of these S&P 500 companies have, have been doing. So before I talk about buybacks a little bit more in depth, I think in general, the, the stock market is very misleading with its valuations and PE ratios, and a lot of it's because of the buybacks. So buybacks, according to Jim Bianco, according to Danielle DiMartino Booth, according to hedge fund manager Christopher Cole of Artemis Capital, buybacks are supporting the stock market. Let me play, I'm going to go back uh, a week to that Danielle DiMartino Booth speech she gave earlier in October. She talked about buybacks. I'm going to play about two minutes worth of clips again to highlight things, but buybacks are decreasing. So buybacks are still massive. There's still hundreds of billions of buybacks that have been done in 2019. I think it's over 700 billion. However, Goldman Sachs is now issuing a warning and they've been listening to the conference calls of all these companies that are reporting Q3 2019 earnings numbers and the Q3 earnings 2019 earnings numbers according to this guy who's a professional money manager on Twitter Greek Fire I follow him Greek Fire 23 201 I guess he doesn't want to use his real name 201 out of 498 S&P 500 companies have reported and earnings growth is minus 0.5% from a year ago and the S&P 500 doesn't seem to care it's still close to all time highs so that just shows you that there's flight capital coming into the U.S. still, there's buybacks still being done, but Goldman is predicting a big drop in buybacks. I'll talk about that in a little bit with the article. I'll read part of it. And let me just play this these audio clips first from Danielle DiMartino Booth because I think they're very important. Because not only is the size of the buybacks enormous, and these uh, corporate executives, the CEOs, the CFOs, in a get-rich-quick scheme, because they're not they're not buying back the shares at a when they think the stock price is cheap. They're buying back the shares to goose earnings higher, to manipulate financially engineer earnings higher. They're not buying back the shares because they think their stock price has an enormous amount of growth ahead. They're buying back the shares to load the balance sheet with debt so they can be rich two, two to five years from now, and then it's some other schmuck's problem five or ten years from now, and that's the problems that General Electric got into. That's the problems that 
Jeff Immelt did. Tons and tons, many billions of dollars in share buybacks with debt, many billions of dollars in bad leverage buyouts with artificially cheap debt. So the corporations, the more central bankers have manipulated the interest rates down, the more these large corporations to, to make earnings higher have done share buybacks with debt at indiscriminate share prices, not because they think their share price is cheap, but because they are using it to steal from shareholders to get rich quick. These share buybacks, in my opinion, are a get rich quick scheme. There is no other way around it. This is a tremendous problem with corporate governance in this country. And I don't think, unfortunately, that it's gonna be fixed anytime soon. So let me just play the audio clips. I played part of these a couple days ago on another live stream show. I took a couple days off from doing live streaming. I needed some more sleep. I needed to recharge a little bit. I wanted to watch some World Series games. Um, for, uh, I can't talk about baseball too much or I'm gonna get nasty one-page email saying my podcast is too important to ever talk about baseball on it, but I needed a little break to clear my head. Okay, so here's Danielle DiMartino Booth. I'm going to play first about 30 seconds of one clip, and then I'm going to move to about a minute and a half of another clip. There are all kinds of charts running around out there that show that over the last X number of years, if you add up every pension fund, private pension, mutual fund, exchange-traded fund, individual investor, add up every single type of stock buyer in the world, net-net negative purchases, as in selling, What's kept the entire stock market held up for years? Anybody? Thank you. Buybacks. Buybacks. If a CFO has to pay attention to their balance sheet, what is the one thing that they're precluded from doing? It's a hint. Same answer. Buybacks. Okay. That's the one clip there. And then let me go to the more in-depth clip. Give me a second to get the right... Okay, that looks like I got it. Here we go. This is another one of my favorite charts. It gets us back to buybacks. What earnings per share would be with and without buybacks. We're obviously he headed into uh, earnings season here in the next few days. We'll hear Levi's come out of the gate first. It used to be Alcoa. Now it's a blue jean company, but whatever. But we're about to go into blackout, buy, buy out, blackout. So that's usually what causes all of the volatility in the merry month of October. But understand that you're talking about a 40% differential between earnings per share with and without buybacks. In the first quarter, excuse me, in the second quarter, just half of the earnings that were reported, and I'll remind you, earnings were negative in the first quarter, just by a hair in the second quarter, Earnings are expected to be down 4% in the third quarter, and Wall Street analysts are holding the line on the fourth quarter to try and hope and pray that they can make 2019 be a positive year for earnings per share, not happening, because the trade war hadn't gone away yet, and we know it hurts. For the last four quarters, S&P 500 earnings overall in the aggregate would have been flat as a pancake, zilch, nothing, without the effect of buybacks. Okay, so to summarize some of the things I talked about, you have Jim Bianco with his research saying that over $5 trillion in share buybacks, a lot of it with artificially cheap debt to load up debt onto the balance sheets in a get-rich-quick scheme by corp large corporate executives have been done by S&P 500 companies. On top of that, research from Danielle DiMartino Booth that she was citing, and also Christopher Cole of Artemis Capital she cited in other presentations. He's another hedge fund manager. Uh, he specializes in volatility. That the earnings per share for S&P 500 companies would be 40% lower without the share buybacks. That means these companies cannot grow revenues. They cannot grow free cash flow. They cannot grow margins or create new products and services. Instead, they are reducing share count to financially engineer earnings higher. So there, in fact, a lot of these large corporations, the revenues are either flat or contracting. So share buybacks. When done correctly, if a company is growing their revenues, they're using free cash flow, they're not using debt on the balance sheet, they can be good. However, you get into situations like General Electric, where General Electric was playing the 
hire all these corporate lobbyists, hire all these tax accountants, hire all these tax attorneys. And General Electric was addicted to corporate welfare and subsidies for years, not paying any taxes. In fact, they're getting tax rebates. And then they were using massive amounts of artificially cheap debt, financial engineering, to do tens of billions of dollars in share buybacks, and then many billions of dollars in leverage buyouts and bad acquisitions that either got written off or never produced the return that they were expecting. And that's why General Electric was in the problems it was. All these compounding. ExxonMobil is another company. So ExxonMobil is not going bankrupt anytime soon. However, Rex Tillerson, when he was the CEO of ExxonMobil, he did many, many billions of dollars of share buybacks when the stock price was at $90 per share or higher. This was going on before the 2008 financial crisis and shortly after the 2000, 2008 financial crisis when oil started to rally after the Fed started to put in QE. And before Rex Tillerson left the company, he was doing massive amounts of share buybacks with debt. And then also bad acquisitions. He overpaid for XTO Energy, uh, I think, over $40 billion. The other company was Kodak. Kodak, before it went bankrupt and reorganized, Kodak thought that they had a moat. They thought that their film development and camera business would not lose any sales, not lose demand, that it was a durable competitive advantage. And... They were destroyed by technology. They were destroyed by borrowing to increase dividends. They were destroyed by borrowing for share buybacks. It was a combination of factors. Kodak did not think that quality digital cameras would be available at cheaper and cheaper prices and then also go into your smartphones too. And they thought that forever, whether it was individual consumers printing pictures like families or individuals printing pictures or in the medical industry with x-rays and other parts, they thought that people would routinely keep printing x-rays and pictures. And they were wrong. And so the executives at Kodak did not adapt. They became a dinosaur. They loaded the balance sheet with debt. They wasted capital. And that's why Kodak had problems. Also, from what I hear, not only did Kodak not adapt to the, the cameras and how the cameras, digital cameras, people were not printing as many pictures. Everything, all the data was getting uploaded, saved onto the camera or on memory cards or up into the cloud now. But the cameras were becoming cheaper. They were becoming higher quality, the digital cameras. And then also the cameras started going into people's smartphones. Kodak totally missed this. And Kodak was in the Dow longer than almost anyone else. Kodak was a long time member of the Dow companies. It's a truly tragic story, but it was predictable. In fact, I, I read somewhere that Kodak research and development people actually invented the digital camera and the executives at Kodak said, no, we can't push this because this will hurt the rest of our businesses. So they didn't believe in the new technology and they didn't adapt and they did the combination of share buybacks with debt and increasing dividends and they did not adapt and they became a dinosaur. So Goldman is saying that share buybacks will potentially start to fall. According to Goldman Sachs, buyback spending slowed 18% down $161 billion during the second quarter of 2019. The firm anticipates that the slowdown will continue. During full year 2019, they expect S&P 500 cash spending declined by 6%, the sharpest annual decline since 2009. So as corporate spending slows, investors hurting for yield should look to high dividend stocks, the firm said. The high dividend stocks are not going to be low P.E. ratio. So the P.E. the PE ratios that people are paying, they might look like 30 percent, uh, excuse me, 30 times earnings. But you have to look at the business. Is revenue growing? Is revenue falling? Is revenue flat? How long has revenue been flat for? Has revenue been flat for five years? So you're paying 30 times or 40 times earnings for a business where the revenue is either flat for a long time, or it's contracting. That's not a cheap stock, quote unquote, cheap stock, or a quote unquote, fairly valued stock. You think that Trump's gonna pass a second tax cut plan? It doesn't benefit people like me. I can tell you that. His uh, tax cut plan only benefits people who are self-employed making at least 65, between 65 and $150,000.
Kodak did invent the digital camera. That's what I said in 1975, but then they did not push it. They did not really roll it out. They also lost in the printer business. They thought that their film development business, people would always want to print out pictures, to have pictures printed out at a photo development shop or Costco or one of those. And they were totally wrong. That business contract contracted rapidly. The problem with tax, Enoch says the tax cuts didn't help him either. The problem with the tax cuts is the global economy is things are looking bad. We even have Xi now, along with Premier Li, a couple months ago in China warning about the Chinese economy. I think things are very serious when you have Xi publicly endorsing blockchain technology, not Bitcoin, recently, and then also warning about the Chinese economy. I think that's very, very serious. Yeah, Sears didn't go online. Sears had lots of inventory. Not a respectable brand. All, all the bricks and mortars retailers have had, almost all of them have had big struggles. Lululemon seems to be the one that's bucking a lot of the trend. Maybe Ulta Beauty and uh, what's the other one? Sephora, the cosmetics ones. Those were doing well, but I think the chart for Ulta Beauty just started to break down. So for 2000, let me read the rest of this article. Corporate buybacks are plummeting as companies tighten their purse strings and it could have a big impact on the stock market, Goldman Sachs warned in a note to clients. In the second quarter, S&P 500 share buybacks totaled $161 billion, about 18% less than the first quarter the firm found. The amount spent on buybacks this year is down 17% from a year earlier. Last year, remember I said in 2018, total buybacks were $1.1 trillion. Now, all of those buybacks were not done with debt. There was some done with free cash flow, but I think a lot of that, uh, I haven't seen anyone exactly split up the amount, but I think a lot of it between free cash flow and debt, but I think a lot of it was done with debt. Although it is on track to be the second highest total on record, Goldman Sachs said, the firm anticipates that this trend will continue, saying early indications suggest second quarter weakness in buybacks may persist. For 2019, total buybacks will drop 15% to, they're projecting it will drop 15% to $710 billion, down from $1.1 trillion. And in 2020, they see a 5% decline to $675 billion, the firm predicted. We don't know. We don't know what's going to happen because if the central banks go to ZERP, if the Federal Reserve goes to ZERP, zero interest rate policy, very quickly, that number could easily reverse very quickly and start to buoy the stock market again. But I think Bianco in that chart, he was saying that a lot, uh, even the net capital inflows, the flight capital is still tiny compared to the share buybacks. Share repurchases have been a key element during the, this bull market, the longest on record also have 123 months of economic expansion officially. So the U.S. is not in a recession, and it looks like in a couple days next week that the Fed will cut rates again. At least that's what the betting is. I think it's around 90% bets, high probability bets that the uh, Fed will cut rates by at least one more quarter point. By repurchasing shares, a company reduces the number of shares outstanding. It can have the effect of boosting the stock price and lifts earnings per share figures by reducing the share count. What they didn't mention was if the company uses debt, it adds a lot of debt to the balance sheet and gives the company a lot uh, a lot less flexibility, especially in the case of a cyclical commodity business like ExxonMobil, which their revenues can fluctuate very, very violently depending upon oil and natural gas prices and what they do. So ExxonMobil was buying back shares at when the oil price was much higher, also when the oil price is lower, they buy them back indiscriminately. I think it's dangerous for a commodity and cyclical business that's very capital intensive to be buying back shares that much. So it's a frequent but not always popular move for companies. Some argue that instead of using buybacks, companies should invest more in capital investments. And Washington, D.C. is taking note. The House Financial Services Committee, for instance, is looking at ways to reform buyback spending laws. All spending is slowing. The slowdown in buybacks is part of a larger trend of spending cuts. I think they're talking about CapEx as trade uncertainty and stalling global growth way in the market. So a lot of these bad Q3 numbers, Q3 2019 earnings reports, the CEOs, the excuse du jour now is, is uh, tariffs and the trade war. But the what's really happening is the global economy slowing for a bunch of different reasons. A lot of it is dollar-denominated debt. You know, we have very smart people in the gold community and 
and uh, alternative media saying that everyone's abandoning the dollar. Well, there's so much dollar denominated debt that all these entities that overborrowed in dollars need dollars to pay back this dollar denominated debt or they could all go bankrupt or collapse first. So you just don't hear that mentioned by a lot of people in the gold community or alternative media. Okay, let me take a look at listener questions and comments now. This is a good question. What is China's endgame with endorsing blockchain? Uh, I was going to address this on another show. I've talked about this. China is going cashless. They're not doing it for positive reasons, for freedom and technology and uh, innovation. This is for cashless society, more control over their own citizens, full total totalitarian government tracking and taxing every transaction. Blockchain technology is a database, and a lot of people say it's slow and clunky, but China would have potentially the ability to remove people from the financial system even easier. They can shut off your credit cards. They can shut down your bank accounts. It could be if you criticize the Chinese government, your credit card, your bank accounts could be shut off very quickly. I haven't seen any article saying if the credit market is freezing up again. I just saw an interview that Bloomberg ran from a couple days ago talking about the leveraged loan market is having immense problems. So CLOs, collateralized loan obligations, which I've been covering now for months, reading research reports on from the Federal Reserve, Bank of International Settlements about CLOs. The leveraged loans are also problems. Yeah, we could see we could see repo the repo numbers repo madness is at least 500 is at least excuse me not 500 billion it's at least 120 billion if you read the press release it's at least 120 overnight so it's probably more than 120 and the dollar on the dollar index the dollar index is back over 98 shockingly so despite increasing repo madness the repo madness problem is not getting better by the way China's doing repo madness too no one talks about that it's a lot smaller. It was only a few billion here, 10 billion there. Starting in January 2019, they started increasing repo. And now I think it's up the repo in China and the Chinese banking systems up to like 10, 10, 20, 30 billion. So it's not to US levels, but it's still bad. So in spite of repo madness getting worse here in the US and not QE program starting with 60 billion in treasuries and other junk bought per month by the Federal Reserve, not QE, in air quotes, QE. The dollar is still back up above 98 on the dollar index. This is a good question. Thank you for the super chat, Dimitri. Why is the VIX so low? I've talked about this at length. I recommended that you go listen to interviews in the archives of the last couple of years from Christopher Cole of Artemis Capital. He is a specialist in volatility trading. He has a uh, special volatility hedge fund that is all he does and he tracks things that a lot of other hedge fund managers don't track and he's been talking about how manipulated the vix is the vix is one of the favorite things i've talked to, i've compared the manipulation in the vix to whack-a-mole how every time the vix pops up for a short period of time it gets whacked back down so there are a lot of pension funds, managers, professional money managers, hedge funds, investment banks that short the VIX and collect the premiums. It is a very overcrowded trade. Um, I think three years ago, Christopher Cole had the estimates on the leverage short volatility trade on the VIX at 1.5 trillion, and that was three years ago. So most likely, I haven't seen any current estimates, but he sends the macro voices people updated slide decks. So if you're on their email list for free, um, he may send a new updated estimate on that size. That trade has to be larger because that was three years ago, larger than uh, 1.5 trillion in size. So the VIX is incredibly manipulated. 
there are tons and tons of people that are selling, shorting the VIX and collecting premiums, betting the VIX will not pop and will not stay high. And when the VIX does go up, they double down or triple down on those trades to short the VIX even more. This has been going on with any VIX pops for three or four years at least, at least. Yeah, so I would go back and listen to the Christopher Cole interviews. He is a true world-class expert on that. There's about three or four interviews in the last few years on uh, the Macro Voices podcast. Yeah, it pops once in a while for a couple days or week, and then it crashes again. It's extremely manipulated. Just like the S&P E-mini... Uh, S&P 500 E-mini futures contract is manipulated. Did you see that Vanity Fair story out where someone made 1.5 uh, billion, excuse me, not trillion, 1.5 billion and then 1.8 billion on front-running Trump's trade announcements? Good question. What are the banks doing with all that JRL innovations with that repo money the Fed is giving them? We wouldn't know for sure. This is why we need audits first. First thing, JRL, we need to see is what the Fed is taking as quote unquote good collateral. Are they taking enormous amounts of mortgage? Are they taking what they claim? What's on the New York Fed website? So first we would need to see that. So are the banks putting out derivatives fires? Are the banks dealing with, with um, counterparties that are failing with their dollar denominated debt? We don't know. That's the problem. And because these uh, repos are so short-term and overnight, a lot of them are overnight or terms, they're not properly disclosing any of this stuff to their shareholders. So their earnings are going to be totally fraudulent, some of these banks. We don't know which banks are even taking the repo. And the Fed intentionally wants it that way. They don't want transparency. They don't want anyone knowing which banks are taking the most repo. For all we know, it could be Deutsche Bank's um, American subsidiaries who are taking all the repo. We don't know. That's a problem. IBJI asks a good question. Are money markets buying corporate bonds? Um, money markets, there was research on this by bank of new york mellon it's on their website i put a link to it in the information and description section of another video in the last week or so and bank of new york mellon took over as custodian of part of the repo market i think from jp morgan about three years ago and they turned a unprofitable repo market where they started taking savings from money markets and then giving the savings to hedge funds to lever up in trades and using those for leveraged trades so there's a big leveraged repo trade market where Bank of New York Mellon is the middleman and they're making big profits off this now and hedge funds are on one, one counterparty and money markets are another and money markets are not supposed to be involved in very leveraged, very risky trades and now they are. And it went from Bank of New York Mellon has a chart on their website and they're bragging about this because they're making so much money doing it, but they increased the risk massively especially to money market people where it went from like zero in this type of repo went from zero to 100 billion per month so there's a hundred billion per month of money market stuff at risk money market savings at risk that's in very highly leveraged hands with hedge funds and we don't know what the hedge funds necessarily are doing with all those trades they could be leveraging treasuries. They could be leveraging mortgage-backed securities. They could be leveraging um, leveraged loans, you know, buying leveraged loans with more leverage. They could be buying collateralized loan obligations with more leverage. Hey, Bill, um... I disagree with Danielle DiMartino Booth on a lot, but I think her insights into the bond market and insights into things like share buybacks and stuff is very good. 
So I don't agree with any one expert completely, but there are bits and pieces of, of a lot of experts out there. Like, I don't agree with Jim Rickards on his conclusion that the IMF is going to issue the SDR and the IMF has a lot of room and is very powerful. There's a lot of governments that actually hate the IMF. A lot of the large governments don't really like it. They put up with it. They send representatives there. They occasionally chip in a little bit of money. Mostly it's the U.S. They don't really like it. So Jim Rickard saying that the IMF has only clean balance sheet and that they're going to do an SDR, I don't see it as of now. Something would have to drastically change. So, But Jim Rickards has good insights on a lot of other things. So that doesn't mean because I don't agree with Jim Rickards on, the S on his SDR thesis, that doesn't mean I don't listen to him. That just means I don't agree with him on that. And I listen to his other insights. Um, my resume, he's asking, I seem knowledgeable and know many CEOs and insiders. How do I not have a job at a major company? Because I don't have an MBA and a law degree. I dropped out of both. And some of my views are controversial. The IMF doesn't have a massive amount of resources. Normally, the IMF has a small amount of the U.S. gave them some gold. The U.S. gives them some resources. And the IMF has to go begging back to the U.S. government for more. The IMF is not super powerful like i think jim rickards makes imf sound a lot more powerful than they really are and bill says they they rape and pillage third world countries professionally yes and china's just copying what the imf does and what european colonialism and the british did mm -hmm. no i saw i saw that michael rupert documentary a long time ago He didn't know he didn't know that shale oil would be subsidized. The US government is subsidizing shale oil now. Almost all of it's uneconomic. The only publicly traded shale oil company that's making free cash flow consistently is EOG Resources. All the others are all in trouble from what I've seen. That's just my opinion. And I was seeing that in late last year. If you go back and listen to the archives, I was writing I was getting paid a good amount of money by a, a research client to write reports and I was saying I was looking at the stock chart and the financial statements of Boeing and I didn't know Boeing was committing fraud with the 737 Max but I said their stock chart had exploded way too much and I was looking through their financials and there was big red flags in Boeing this was November and December of last year 2018 after Boeing stock went up like threefold in the last couple of years I was warning then about Boeing to my research customer who was paying me and then also about the oil the shell producers so I was right on those, and I got fired anyway. Oh, well. Oh, um, I wanted to mention a couple things here. Um, thank you very much to my now over 180 Patreon account contributors. I think it'll be 200 probably in the next couple months. It's pretty amazing. You guys are allowing me to grow my small business, reducing stress in my life because YouTube could potentially pull the plug. They've dropped my subscriber count down, my subscriber growth. I think I've added 100 new subscribers in the last like six or seven weeks, which is ridiculous because I was growing at 2,000 new subscribers for months. So that's about dead. And my ad revenues are down 30% now in the last like six weeks on uh, Google AdWords revenues. So thank you to everyone who listens to the two, two ads, but Google's taking more and more of the ads. It is what it is. So as long as the money's coming in from Patreon, I'll keep making the content, but there's not a lot of good options for moving my content elsewhere right now, unfortunately. And if you're creative, if you're an artist and you want your podcast, you want some free advertising and you want a podcast, if you're a graphic designer or an artist and you come up with a really cool like repo madness or shell bubble, shell, shell unicorn bubble or, or, um, low interest rate party bus, you make something funnier with like unicorns on the party, like Silicon Valley unicorns on the party bus or shale oil unicorns or something like a black shale oil unicorn on the low interest rate party bus, you make a cool economic cartoon like that, I will use it if you want the exposure, the marketing. I will use it as a uh, background for my audio podcast. So if you're interested, just shoot me an email. We can talk about that. If you want more exposure for your work or you just want to help me out, I appreciate it. 
But I have a couple other articles here about share buybacks. There's a really good one from my friend Jeff Desjardins on, from March 1st of 2019. He really summarizes very, very well the controversy about share buybacks. I don't think all share buybacks are inherently bad. If the company stock is not going up and the company's growing revenues and making more money and everyone says bad things about the company and the company has a free cash flow to buy back stock as long as they're not loading the balance sheet with debt, if they think their stock is cheap on a different on one or more valuation metrics, I think that's smart long term. But you could get in a situation if you do buybacks wrong. It is a get rich quick scheme. You could get in the company could get in a situation with with Campbell Soup now, where they've done tons of bad deals and buybacks, and Campbell Soup has a 64 times price to earnings ratio with no growth, no revenue growth. Revenues are contracting, and earnings are not really that much at all. Or a situation like General Electric, where General Electric has been doing just massive amounts of financial engineering for the last 10, 15, 20 years. And then ExxonMobil, where ExxonMobil bought back tens of billions in share buybacks at $90 per share. And the stock price right now is at $69 per share. So those tens of billions in buybacks that ExxonMobil bought back, their stock, were all at losses. Meanwhile, the former CEO and former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson made you know, hundreds of millions of dollars for himself in salary and stock options. Buybacks screw shareholders in the long run. No, I disagree. I actually have empirical, I have studies with empirical evidence showing that with free cash flow and if management team times it right and buys the stock back when it's cheap without using debt that the stock price actually drastically outperforms. I have, I have studies with empirical evidence. I'll put a link to the study if you want to take a look. So bottom line here, share buybacks done with massive amounts of debt. We'll see what happens with the central banks and zero interest rate policy. As of now, buybacks are supposed to decrease, which means that there will be less propping up the stock market. Although if Trump tweets more, he's going to try to keep manipulating it. But the reality of the the trade negotiations between the U.S. and China is not exactly positive right now. Yeah, everyone is focused on earnings per share. Also, the ratings agencies, I forgot to mention this, the ratings agencies are enormously complicit in this because all these large corporations are drastically over leveraging their balance sheets to do share buybacks or leverage buyouts. They're loading the balance sheets with debt and the debt coverage ratios are super laxed. They're not strict. So the ratings agencies have also allowed way too many buybacks with debt to go on. And these buybacks are so bad with debt that it's a get-rich-quick scheme. Ten years from now, some of these large corporations, even though they do have solid underlying consumer businesses, but if the company has way too much debt, the company to survive will have to sell assets. They'll have to, do, uh, they'll have to raise prices. They'll have to do a lot of things. They may have to fire employees. Well, I also made a call. Thank you, Haster of Carcosa. Yeah, I also made a good call. It was just my opinion on Tilray. And then Beyond Meat, the lockup period. The lockup period just happened just expired for for insiders in Beyond Meat. So they're, I haven't checked the numbers, but if they haven't already started massively dumping their shares, they will soon. This is how it works with these Silicon Valley unicorns, these drastically overvalued IPOs. You have to wait, once the lockup period expires and the insider six months after the stock goes IPO are allowed to dump the shares, they and the stock price is up fivefold or tenfold, they all start dumping their shares. So that was predictable. So I will put the articles to the research with the share buybacks if you want to do more research and read on this more. And I think that Danielle DiMartino Booth interview was very good. Again, I don't agree with her on a lot of the stuff about the Federal Reserve. I think she defends the Fed way too much. But her insights on the bond market and share buybacks, I think, are, are very, very accurate. And, you know, I, I take a look at the research and the work of a lot of different experts. Oh, I don't trust the ratings agencies at all. And in fact, I've heard from, from a source um, in Asia that this is also going on in the Hong Kong ratings agencies too. So not only is it in the U.S., it's also the Hong Kong 
ratings agencies of the Hong Kong listed shares. So this is a global problem. Okay, well, that's it for tonight. I want to thank everyone for their time, and I'm going to work my butt off creating unique content. I'm, it looks like I'm going to have a couple interview guests this week, so I won't name them yet, but I think that you're going to like them. And uh, there's a lot of very interesting topics to talk about the stuff. I'll have a China show. There's a lot of stuff going on in China, crazy stuff. It's been just accelerating for the last 8 to 12 months, the crazy stories coming out of China, and she has made some very interesting comments on a number of different things in the last couple of days. So there will be a show on that probably in the next couple of days as well.